Hello, I'm Mike Rowe. I'm Chief Economist at the Resolution Foundation, and today we're going to talk about inequality and economic growth. And I'm here with a colleague of mine. Hi everyone, I'm Lala Petrai, and I'm an economist at the Resolution Foundation. So let's start really big picture, really broad overview. What has happened to income inequality over, say, the last 50 years in the UK? So when talking about income inequality in the UK, you've got to start by looking at the 1980s. And the 1980s is a period where income inequality increased in this country. And one way to think about whether we are very unequal as a country or not is to compare us to other countries. So before the 80s, the UK would have been considered quite an average country when it comes to inequality. However, after the large increase in inequality that happened during the 80s, and it's also worth bearing in mind that inequality hasn't changed much since that time period, it's worth thinking about the fact that the UK is one of the more unequal countries in Europe. The US, I think, is the only country that is more unequal than us. Right, so the 1980s is where all our troubles began when it comes to inequality, with a huge surge in, in, in any measure of inequality, really. I mean, people are write, write books about what happened in the 1980s, but can you give, give us the headlines? What, what, why did inequality go up by so much in the UK then? There's about four main reasons why inequality went up quite a lot in the 1980s. One of them is pay rose a lot in the 80s, but much more so for higher paid workers than lower paid workers. We also saw some tax cuts as well, and those tax cuts very much benefited higher income households the most. One other thing that has happened for when you compare the 1980s to the situation we are in now is that housing costs have gone up quite a lot. In 1980, a typical family would have spent 9% of their total income on housing costs. And then if you fast forward to the early 2020s, that's gone up to 17%. And this is something that puts more pressure on lower income households as they have lower incomes to begin with. And if, and if we think about another source of income, which would be that from, that from state benefits, if we go back even further to the 60s and 70s, some benefits would be increased each year in line with earnings, but there was a crucial change at the start of the 1980s, wasn't there? Yes, there was a change that we're still feeling the effects of today. So currently benefits, well, most benefits are increased using inflation every year. And that basically means that the level of benefits stays flat in real terms and inequality rises if you do that as lower income households are more likely to either completely rely on benefits as their source of income or get more of their income from benefits than from work. And when wages rise and benefits rise, but by less than wages, inequality increases. Right, so the 1980s kind of was, was also the decade where the UK had very high levels of economic growth, in part due to the government's economic reforms, where we had growth, growth up, but also inequality up. So now let's skip, skip forward a couple of decades over the 2000s. Growth was also fairly robust, at least in the start of that decade, but we also saw things like relative poverty, particularly child poverty, falling. So what was going on in the 2000s that meant that there was no longer this pressure on inequality? Comparing what happened in the 1980s to what happened in the early noughties really shows what a difference policy changes make when policy changes are focused on helping the poorest in our society. So as you mentioned, child poverty did go down during this period. So it went down from 34% in sort of the mid nineties to, I think it was about 27% in the mid 2000s. Especially in the early 2000s, uh, governments were raking it in as it were, but, but it was also that the, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister at the time decided that child poverty was a focus and they could use some of that resources to, to prop up the incomes of lower income families. So now we're in the financial crisis happened in the late, late 2000s and in the 2010s. What's going on then when it comes to growth and inequality? So many of us think of the 2010s as a period where we've sort of stagnated as a country when it comes to economic growth and when it comes to wage growth as well. So 
our wages at the moment are currently lower than they were in 2008 in real terms, which is definitely not a position any of us want to be in, that we're poorer than we were 15 years ago. So we've had really weak wage growth, and that's one of the reasons why people feel like inequality is really high and poorer households really aren't doing well at the moment. Another reason is that during the 2010s, we had a lot of either cuts to benefits or times when benefits weren't increased by inflation, and that meant that they fell in real terms, and that made lower income households poorer. And the whole title of our report is called Stagnation Nation, and that's, that, that's our summary of the 2010s, really. Very little economic growth, we're stagnating, but we're lumbered with this high, high rate of inequality. And it's very telling that the, the fraction of the population who think that inequality and poverty is, a, is a, one of the country's top concerns really went up a lot in the, in the 2010s from about 9% at uh, the start of the 2010s to, to double that, nearly one in five towards the end of the decade. So inequality becomes more salient, more, more important to people when you have uh, no growth. What some people would say who don't think inequality is necessarily the thing we should care about is that it doesn't matter if inequality is high or not, what matters is that in incomes are rising and what would you say to people who would say why should we care that inequality is high? I mean, we, you can get quite philosophical answering that question, sort of thinking about some issues like fairness, but there's also some really hard social science evidence that high levels of inequality are bad for the country. And there's two sorts of ways in which it can be bad for the country. So there's some research which suggests that eventually high levels of inequality are just bad for economic growth. They just hold you back as, as a country. I mean, even organisations like the IMF or the OECD um, think, think that can be the case if inequality gets high enough. But on a more kind of day-to-day -day basis and what's more relevant to, 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 pe to, to real people is that inequality seems to be bad for social outcomes. So in, in countries where there's high inequality, people are less trusting, they're more stressed and they're, they're more unhealthy. And so you just get countries that are really less pleasant places to be in. So I think that those are two, two, two areas where actually quite a lot of research in the last 10 years has shown there's a fairly fairly strong link between high levels of inequality and your country just being a less nice place to be. Now, we at the Resolution Foundation, we really care about people on low to middle incomes. So why is high inequality specifically bad for those people? Yeah, so here it's this, this toxic combination of low growth and high inequality, like what happened in, in the 20, 2010s, it just means there's just nothing, no resources available, no, 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 no proceeds of growth to share out at all. And so it, it makes for dismal outcomes for, for low to middle incomes, um, low to middle income households. And you can also see that if you compare the UK to some of our European, European neighbours, um, the UK is a little bit poorer than France on average, to take an example. So a typical UK household is about 7% poorer than a typical French household. But because we have high levels of inequality, a low-income UK household is about a fifth poorer than a low-income French household. The difference is worth about £4,000 a year to living standards. And so that, that's, where the, that's where we get the double whammy. We're, we're not doing great in terms of economic growth, but then we're also hampered by a high levels of inequality. That's what really hurts living standards of, of low to middle income families. So that's all quite depressing. Um, so it's time to, time to cheer us up. I mean, we also, of course, be looking in our Economy 2030 report at what we could do about this. How can we get out of our stagnation? How can we get growth back? And how can we get uh, inequality up? So, I mean, on, on growth, some of our key uh, solutions were focusing on our strengths as a nation, which means sort of leaning into our service exporting, high skill, high productivity industries. It means leveling up properly and making the most out of our, 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 our twin, our second tier cities like Birmingham and Manchester. Um, and it means investing more, both in private and public sector. But I, I think if the, if the UK was to do all of those, there's a risk we might just go back to the 1980s and see inequality rise. So we've got to uh, combine those, those, those policies that go for growth with policies that mean we have shared growth. It's definitely true that doing those things you've suggested would be really good for economic growth as a whole. It would boost our GDP and it would very much boost wages of certain people. So for example, if you were someone that worked in the service industry, 
and you lived in say one of our second cities so somewhere like Manchester for example doing those policies would work out really well for those kinds of people however not everyone can work in services or live in a big city there's lots of people in the country who work in jobs so for example like hairdressers or cleaners who wouldn't necessarily benefit from those policies and one way we can make sure those people benefit in our economy is by promoting good work and there's a few different ways you can think about good work so good work is work that's well paid previous increases in the minimum wage have made a really big difference to pay inequality so we think that should keep happening but pay is not the only thing people tell us is important about work they also tell us that having security in their job is really important so for example things like knowing when your shifts will be ahead of time so you can plan your life around them and knowing how many hours a week you're going to be working are really important so we've got a kind of growth policies which are good for wages, good for jobs amongst the kind of high skill, export facing, service sector type people. And we've got a good work agenda, which is pushing up the minimum wage, making work more appealing, making work more secure, but, but not everyone can work, can they? So there's a third, the third component of, of the strategy and that's to deal with, um, that's to think about the benefit system and what, what that can do, to, what that can do in a strategy for shared growth. We must definitely make sure that people who aren't in paid work aren't losing out on income growth. So for example, people at the lower end of the income distribution are a lot more likely to rely on benefits for either all of their income or some of their income. And one way we can make sure that they benefit from the proceeds of economic growth is by increasing their benefits in line with earnings growth. Things would look a bit different to our current system where they increase with inflation. And this would mean that people at the bottom end of the distribution aren't locked out of income growth. It's also worth changing some elements of the benefit system that basically create these quite hard edges and make certain people poorer. So getting rid of things like the two child limit would also go away to making sure income growth is a bit more equal as would making our tax system a bit fairer as well. And when you put all of those things together, and you add them to making work better and increasing economic growth, you end up with a lot of income growth across the income distribution, but you also end up with income growth that's more progressive. So lower income households get more income growth than higher income households, and this means that inequality will fall. So today we've touched on some of the highlights of our Economy 2030 report, but you can read much more, both about our diagnosis of the problems and our proposals for how next government can make things better, crucially to get growth up, but also inequality down.